Hello, welcome to the video for a Game Jam Breakdown for January 2016. The game's name is Zila. So, this is going to be the first in a new series of videos that hopefully people will enjoy. This is a test. If you obviously don't enjoy this, please let me know in the comments. Thumb it down if you need to. If you do enjoy it, let me know in the comments. Thumb it up if you enjoy it. Basically, every month, Unreal Epic Games it holds a jam using Unreal Engine where from Thursday around 1 p.m. Pacific till around 9 p.m. Pacific on Sunday, so about three and a half days, you get to make a jam game as quickly as possible, fitting whatever theme they pick and announce that day. And then usually the next week they judge it and they pick the top three and then those people get shirts and hats and various other things. Now, I've done this a few times. Every time I've done it, I've gone ahead and released the source code for other people to peruse and look at. Usually, I will take my time when I do it. I'll make sure blueprint nodes are lined up and the connecting execute wires are lined up. I'll comment things as needed. and I'm, Because once it's done, I might give it another half a day of polish, fix any bugs I find after release, and then release into the wild so that way people can learn from it. Now, one of the things that I'm going to do different this time is I did not work on the last day. I worked only up through Saturday. I did not take a lot of time in cleaning the code. I didn't take a lot of time of tweaking things. Basically, my goal was to jump in from literally a blank project, create everything I wanted, figure things out as I went along, I left in any problems, I left in bad spaghetti code, and I didn't comment most of the things unless I needed to because I forgot what I was doing. And what I'm going to do for these videos is I'm now going to break down from start to finish throughout the process over multiple videos. I'm going to try to keep each video around half an hour or so and release them daily until I'm done. And I'm going to cover how I did everything from the start to the end, like I said. And we're going to go over the code. I'm going to clean up the code while I'm going over it and discuss what I did, add in the comments, point out any bugs or problems I had, fix any issues I have, maybe add in new things. For example, I wanted to add in a soundtrack, but I didn't get to have a chance for it. That was one of the things that was mentioned during the live stream playthrough. So more than likely, I'll take the music track that I created for the game and introduce it into the game itself and then pop the code in and show you how I would do that as well. So <clears throat> let's go ahead and let's get started. So this is the game right here. And the game is called Zila. Basically how it came to be, the theme for the game jam is don't push the button. So of course I thought of some different crappy ideas. Normally my first couple crappy ideas I don't use. I'll normally wait, even though the game jam starts at 1 after the theme gets announced, I wait. I have kids I usually pick up around 1.30 that same day, the other ones come home, we have chores, we do homework. So I usually work with them and try to get ideas. I try to involve, involve my family. So this one came about when my son Alex, which if you read the name of the game is Alex Backwards, came up with the idea for the game. What When I asked, told him what the theme was, he said, well, what if the button eats people or sets people on fire? So that got me into the idea, well, the button can be the protagonist. So that got me thinking some more, and basically this is the game we came up with. Now, there may be audio. I don't know if it's going to be too loud or not. If it is, you can, of course, turn it down, but I think it's okay. I'm just going to go through the intro, show the basics of the game, and then we'll get right into coding and from there. I've been waiting so all day. Your manager need help. Like Hurry play up. Play I've been waiting an customer hour. service. This is boring. This is taking so long. This sucks. Hurry up. Ow. It's crowded. I've Stop been pushing me. Where's your manager? I need help. Stop Hurry it. Up. I've been I need customer an service. Stop this is pushing ah. me. It's taking so long. This sucks. Hurry I'm up. I'm not gonna get pushed around no more. <laughs> Ow. Okay, if you want customer service, if you can't wait, fine. I'll give it to you now. 
Okay, so you'll notice when we start on the right hand side, I have the controls. And after Bing five bong. seconds, those disappear. Bing bong. Customers need assistance on floor one. And then we have some people over here I can run into. Ah. And it will destroy them, leave, de leave decals on the ground. Bing bong. And based on my spawn bing manager, bong. Customers you will get a notification that you can hear a little two. bing bong sound. And then it bing lets bong. us know these people. Now bing we also bong. have a ah. customers where need shoot assistance laser beams. on floor two. And you'll notice when we get near, when we're within firing range, the targeting reticle will turn red. That'll indicate we have a good shot. Now this will continue on. There are six ways Bing of varying bong. different Bing bong. enemies. Customers need enemies. assistance on floor three. They spawn three. from based on the spawn manager. Bing bong. Bing and bong. On the left side, Customers so need assistance on floor three. How many three. people spawned and how many we've destroyed Bing and how many bong. people have gotten away. Bing and then on the right is a little countdown timer. On floor three. There's a little multiplier bonus. As long as you destroy someone within five seconds, your bonus will continue. Ah. And it will count up continually. And one of the nice little features I put in because I thought it was pretty cool. Bing bong. Diablo Bing bong. Customers the numbers will get larger on depending on the size of and two. Ah. So as you can see, it's ah. six semi Larger, and then of course, when my timer goes down, it'll drop down to a smaller font size. Bing bong. You keep score at the top Bing of the screen. Bong. Once it's over, you go ahead and you get a game over screen, which is a customer survey results, and it puts it onto your screen. So let's go ahead and get started because that's a lot of stuff there, but obviously, we did not start with anything. So when I started this project, my one of my goals, because one of the streams I wanted to do of tutorial for is how to do a player controller from scratch. Someone mentioned in their college course or their learning course for Unreal Engine that they weren't allowed to use the default first person, third person controller. They had to create their own input system and their own controller from scratch. Now, I decided, okay, well, I will do a video on that and I'll learn how to do that. So to start off with, I made a new project used nothing just a straight blueprint project and then i load it up first thing i normally do which is a test map it's just our normal first screen with nothing in it but our player character the goal here is to try to get a basic layout or get our character inside and figure out what we're going to do now one of the driving forces on this game was i wanted to do this for the tutorial so i wanted to keep it as rough as possible but still fully polished and playable a completed game i also decided since this is a jam game and I wasn't going to use Sunday, I was going to limit myself. I was going to learn it's good enough as is. If you notice during the intro, the characters have really harsh shadowing on them. If you actually look closely, you'll notice that their eyes, um, the eyebrows were not opaque because I forgot to turn transparency on for the masking on that texture. I just remember it. I keep forgetting. And there's various other small things like that. I originally intended for that scene that you played out in to actually be a mall with destructible objects and stores and, you know, wall textures and then clothing and racks and all that stuff, but it's all extra stuff. And as I played through the game, I found that I didn't need the extra stuff. The point was just to try to get my multiplier higher and to destroy things and to make it as amusing as possible with the sound effects. So things got cut out. But the game, the base of the game obviously is I need something I can do. So I started off with a new test map. So even before then I need a character in the game. So what I did was I fired up Moto, which is what I use for my modeling. I created just this little simple button. It's just a cylinder with an extruded center part and then a smooth edge on the top. Later on I decided to add this little spinning blade which you see here in the game which we'll cover later. And all that is is another cylinder with the edges turned. And it's actually completely solid. I just have it run through the character model itself, and you can't really tell. I exported it out, and what I ended up with was our main model here, which is actually right here, which is our main model here. So this is our main model that we're working with. And as you can see, I actually have two different texture material maps here. I have one for the button itself, which is our top part, and then one for the base, which is our bottom part. Once I got the model in, well, you can't really do anything with the model. I made it really simple. I made two simple little textures here. When I originally started, I did something like this. I did a white 
with a little bit of metallic and a little bit of roughness to give me this little plastic sheen. For the button, I actually did the same thing here, which you can actually see my old texture right here, which later I changed and we'll cover that when I do it, but basically I just had a simple red button. Now when I imported it, I imported it as a skeletal mesh because in order to use the character controller in the game or the character movement or the default character pawn act, character actor, you need a skeletal mesh. You do not have to have animations to use a skeletal mesh. They can be an unanimated object like this right here. Skeletal mesh just means it's intended for use with a skeleton, which is right here, which has one bone, just a root, and that's it. So once I got it in, it started the task of, well, I need to be able to control it now. So in order to control something generally, inside of Unreal Engine, they give you helper functions. If you create a new blueprint, you'll find these common classes. Actor, which is your base, pawn, character, a player controller, game mode, actor component, scene component, and actually you have access to probably maybe a hundred more in here, individual ones. But if you've ever created a first or third person, it creates player controllers to control the player, and it creates characters, which are the characters that you're controlled with the player controller. And it's a little complicated, but we'll get into exact how it works here in a second. Now, one of the other videos I said, this is the way that Unreal Engine is designed, but it doesn't mean you have to do it that way. You don't have to use a game mode. Using a player controller is completely optional to control your player. It even tells you that, um, I believe if you're reading the documentation, it even tells you a player controller is not required to control the player. You can have your control movement in the character itself. And actually, if you use the third person or first person templates, you're going to find all of the player controls are in the character itself and the player controller is empty. It's still there, it's required, but it's empty. I decided since I'm doing this from scratch and using it as a learning project because it's a game jam. It, the whole point is to learn and do stuff as quickly as possible and see how far you can stretch yourself. I'd go ahead and try making a controller that controls a pawn, uh, that, that controls a character, sorry, and have everything separated. So our first thing is we need a character. So I went ahead and I created a new blueprint of type character. And by default, you're going to end up with this right here. Now, you're not going to have any of your code in here, which, like I said, I was not joking by the fact that I need to clean this up. And we're going to cover cleanup. But you end up with an empty character. You know what? Let's go ahead and let's just make a new empty character. Make it easier. Here we go. Here's our new empty character. You'll notice there's no actual code. Just a few stubs. And you'll notice it inherits things from the parent class of character. The important one here is actually our character movement component. This thing is fantastic. It takes care of a lot of your basic movement code and the ability to move in a few simple nodes and I'll show you how great this is. Other than that you get your capsule component which is going to be basically the collision bounds for what your, your character's movement itself on your scene. An arrow component which is just simply showing which direction is forward. One thing to keep in mind, arrow components are not used inside of a compiled or built game. Those are removed. So that's kind of important if you ever intend on using an arrow component for something. And then mesh, which is just our mesh, which is a skeletal mesh for holding our skeleton or person or in our case, our button. So pretty simple. All I did was slap in on our mesh itself, the character, which is our button. I went ahead and took our capsule component and resized it so it's a little bit rounder because I want it to fit our character. I, you know what? Limitation, can't draw legs, can't do anything organic, didn't want to animate legs, so screw it. We got a floating character. Boom, there we go. He floats. There's our solution to our problem. So he floats. I went ahead later on. I added another mesh here which holds our blade which we'll cover later and then I added a few other points in here which basically is our crosshair our laser pointer for our left eye and our laser pointer for our right eye to determine where the lasers shoot out from 
And then we have our spring arm and our camera, which we use in order to actually see. So if you don't have a spring arm or camera, if you don't have a camera, you're actually not going to be able to see anything from your character. So in use, in here, if we were to go in and change this to our game mode and hit play, we will finally have our little character. And you actually notice I have a user interface, I have a score, I have, I have a fire. All of these things are actually hooked up inside of my game mode and my character. So I could actually just move my character around from scene to scene. So once you start off with your character here, ignoring all of our extra stuff, you're basically just going to have something that does nothing. If we, you know what? We have our little character here, and we open it back up. We slap on our little button mesh, and that's it. If we were to actually go ahead, and this is, let's call this test car. And we were to go ahead and go into our game mode, and we were to change our default from the Zilla character to our test character. And we hit play. There we go. That's what we have. <clears throat> we have something that really doesn't help us. Now, why do we have something that doesn't really help us? Well, like I said before, you don't have a camera. So when I hit play here, you're noticing you're inside your character. So that's why it's important. One of the first things I did was I added a spring arm and a character. If you've never used those before, it's nice and simple. You can just add a spring arm in here somewhere oh let's type sp let's try that there we go spring arm and then you can add a camera to that parent it if you look in here you'll find that set up like that now if we were to run this you're actually going to see we have a camera you can take your spring arm and we can move it up and now we have the camera moved up and there we go now, I could rotate that, and the only reason I could rotate that was because I'm using my controller. So if we were to go back here, for example, and change this back to player controller, and hit play, I'm moving my mouse and nothing's happening. Well, this is the issue you're going to run into first. You can't actually control your character. You have no code set up to control it. I didn't start off with the default one, so I wanted to create one, so therefore we can't do anything. And as you've noticed, I've actually been going through my game mode and changing out my character and my controller. This is one thing that's kind of cool about using things separated. If you notice in here, I have a spectator controller and I have a game state. When you start separating things, I could, for example, let's say I have a controller set up for maybe a first person using WASD to move and maybe the mouse to look and fire. But then I wanted to switch maybe to a top-down RTS isometric and I didn't want to use WASD maybe I wanted to use just the mouse to move well if it's inside your character for the movement code you might have to branch back and forth ifs and ands and things like that but if you actually have it in the controller you can just swap the controller out on your character and be able to change how your character is controlled just by swapping out your controller and the other nice thing is, and this is something that's important, and one of the reasons why I decided to do this, I didn't use it in the game, but it's forward thinking. When a character is destroyed, for example, my character explodes and he dies, if we had a lose condition, anything on that character is gone. So if I had any points on the character, it's gone. Any controls on the character are gone. The controller does not get destroyed. That is basically attached to you, your input. So if you have multiple people, each person would have their own controller. So you can use that controller to stay persistent between each and every pawn they may control. So maybe if you want to jump in and out of different pawns, different, you know, you have four different characters you control, you would have one player controller, and then you could jump in and out of the pawns without having to worry about redoing your controls and remapping controls and stuff like that. So by keeping things segregated and separated, we can easily adapt our program later. So here's our test character. We run it. We can't do anything. So let me go ahead and go back to our character that we have set up. And you'll notice in here, I don't have any controls because I told you I kept things separate. So I created a 
controller, which as you'll notice is not commented. I actually have two sections commented here already. Our mouse look and our keyboard movement, which is what we're going to cover right now. So the easiest one to do here, if we look at in terms of nodes, is our mouse look. And this one's pretty simple. We basically are getting our pawn, which is the target of our controller. We're basically getting our controller. So um, this is our controller, our Zilla controller. Our Zilla controller is attached to a pawn. So based on our game mode, which of course I closed down, let's go ahead and set this back. We have our Zilla character. And controlling our Zilla character is our Zilla controller. So inside of our controller, there's a convenience function called get controlled pawn. Basically, it automatically tells us which pawn we're controlling. Now inside that pawn is going to be the character movement component. This component has a hundred different options maybe that are given to us. Things like how it moves, how it's affected by gravity, what speeds it can move at when it's walking and crouched, how far of an angle it can walk, if it can jump, how high it can jump, how is it affected by gravity and velocity when it jumps, can it swim, can it fly, custom movement speeds, physics interaction, can you push things, can you be affected by push. Character movement, these are how artificial intelligence works when you're using a nav mesh. Movement capabilities, if it's a using a nav mesh, how high can it walk, can it crouch, can it jump, the different AI features. If it's supposed to be using AI, velocity, which is a readable setting based on its movement. Planar movement, do you want to constrict it to a plane? Do you want to make it where it can only, for example, go forward and backwards and not left and right? So character movement gives us this giant list of options and it gives us a bunch of convenience nodes like add controller pitch and add controller yawn. Yaw, not yawn. There's also add controller roll. Uh, if I pull it off of here, add controller roll input. So it's really nice and handy to be able to basically take an input, which is our mouse add it to our controller and have the controller take care of everything. It takes control of, sorry, uh, it takes care of things like gimbal lock and how it moves according to where you're at and how the spring arm works. And basically we say, hey, get the mouse's Y axis whenever we turn it and add it to the pitch, get the mouse's X input, add it to the yaw, and that's it, we're done. Doing these two nodes here, gives us the ability for me to turn the character. You see how the push is staying the same? Gives me the ability to look up and down and rotate. All that basically those two nodes. Now how it's working is it's taking the input access and adding that into the pitch or the yaw. Now you may be, here's an issue you're gonna run into if you create a brand new project. These things are not defined. If we go back here, like I said, this is going to be a lot of stuff over a lot of videos because there's actually a lot of work that goes into setting up your project to get it up and running. This is one of those things. In your project settings, you have an input section. By default, this is empty if you create a blank project. If you're creating a first person or third person project, Unreal automatically takes care of all this for you and it takes care of all this controller stuff that we're doing. They give you a ton of stuff just to be nice. So what we did is I set up axes and actions. Axis, axis move, axis mapping or axis movement is basically like you have your gamepad or your joystick. Left and right, up and down would be an axis. So left and right would be a horizontal, up and down would be a vertical. Same thing with a mouse. If you move your mouse left or right, it's a horizontal movement on the X. If we move our mouse on the Y, as you can see, I have it mapped to Y. So as you can see here, basically, I have some settings for my input and my action. For my access mapping, I have D and A, which is our left and right on our keyboard, to be move right. And you'll see why it's called move right. And then we have move up, which is mapped to our W and S, which is, as you can see here, 
and then mouse X is left and right, and mouse Y is up and down. Now you may be wondering why the mouse is, or hopefully you're not wondering actually, but if you are, the mouse is only have one input key, while our up, down, left, and right keyboard have two. Well, your mouse X value is left and right, it's automatically going to adjust negative or positive depending on which direction you're going. Your mouse Y is going to be the same thing, positive or negative depending on if you're going up or down. With a keyboard, when you hit the D key, it doesn't know the opposite. It knows that basically D is going to do something. In this case, D is going to be a positive value and A is going to be a negative value. So basically D, when I hit D, I'm going to move right, which is why I'm calling it right, or positive value, and then A, which is the left, which is my negative value. And it's going to be the opposite for here. And you'll see how these work shortly. For our action mappings, actions are basically on or off, pressed or released. We could have mapped our up, down, left, right, or move right, move left, move up, move down, to an action mapping. Captured when I pushed D and told it to move to the right. And when I captured A, told it to move to the left. We could have done that. But by doing it this way, using an axis, we get access to one of those helper nodes, which I'll show you, and it makes it super simple to move. So back to our action mappings, it's pretty simple. I have a left mouse button, which I named left mouse button because I only had left mouse button. Later on, I decided to add space bar and right mouse button for the attack, just because it makes it easier than you have a bunch of options. Unfortunately, inside of your code, here's my controller right here. If I find my left mouse button right here, input action, left mouse button. If I was to go into my project settings and rename this to like attack or fire, this right here is not going to change. I would have to go back into my code and rename all of my nodes to the new setting here. And I'm just lazy. This is a game jam project and I'm showing you a problem. I left it as is. So this is an instance where maybe it would have been smarter to just name this as action or fire or action one, something generic where I wouldn't have to worry about renaming it later on. The other one I have is a pause button, which is basically set up to pause the game as needed. Here's another issue. I have P and escape set up. Traditionally on the computer, escape is going to be your pause menu. When you're playing in the editor and you hit escape, it ends play in editor. It's really annoying to test your menu that way. When you build the game in standalone, once it's actually playing normally, escape works fine. You don't have the editor overwriting. That's actually one of the project settings in here somewhere, which I don't look for half the time. But it's a setting that you can actually change if you want to. But for me, I find it easier just not even spend the time worrying about it. Set up an alternate. Set up your escape button for your normal and then set up an alternate button for pausing so you can actually test when you're inside of the game itself in the editor. So that's our input settings. So going back to our character, which I've apparently lost, our controller, here we go. We have our mouse look. So like I said, we have it set up where it's an access. So when I move left and right, it uses at access X. When I move up and down, it uses access Y. And then adds it automatically using our happy controller movement inputs. This right here, this is all that's needed here for keyboard movement. Technically, there's some extra stuff in here, like our move speed multiplier, which actually I'm going to go ahead and just delete because it didn't actually... Wait, did that one work right? Huh, hold on a second. Let me check. I think I just, oh, well, let me reconnect that. I think that was one of those things I was playing with. Yeah, I was playing with and it didn't do anything I wanted. So we'll go back to, we'll leave this as is. So, how's this work? Well, like I said before, if I'd use the input, for example, let's say we did um, pause. And we'll go with the action event pause button. You'll notice pause has pressed and released. So I'd have to have an event for when I press it and then an event for when I release it. And this is only going to happen when you press the button. So if I press and hold, it's only going to fire this event once. So I'd have to continually monitor and make sure the button's pressed. And then add input and add movement. 
when you're using axis it axes every frame where input is enabled where this access works basically it, this value is going to be fired into our scale value so every tick our move right is going to have a value zero if we're doing nothing one if we're moving right negative one if we're moving left so by hooking these things up I can continually have this running automatically, checking for input, and then doing something. So what do we do? Well, all of this extra stuff, ignoring these first two nodes here, all of this is just getting a value. This is all we're using to set the value. Again, two nodes because of character movement. Add movement input and add movement input. And I know it seems kind of simple. It's the same node. Well, it is. We're just adding either right vectored movement or forward vectored movement so let's see how that works so pretty simple we have our controlled pawn again I told you convenience function down here our controller has a pawn so we get the pawn we're getting the rotation the rotation of the controller for this pawn basically this rotation right here is we're looking forward and if I was to move left and right, as you can see there, let's say our rotation is zero. Let's say our rotation is 90, 180, 270, back to zero. So what it's doing is when we get controlled rotation, it's using the character movement and it's saying here is your rotation. So that's what this does. So using our nice happy functions and our helper methods, we don't have to figure out which way is forward. We just say, hey, let me have your pawn. Hey pawn, what is your rotation right now according to your controller? Because we're using character movement controllers. It says, here you go, here's my rotation. So we see, okay, now this is important. We break the rotator apart. We only want the Z. If we use the X or the Y, it's going to give us some really funky output. If you want, well, let's see if I can show you by not breaking this. Okay, let's try this. So, everything seems fine. Movement left, right. If I look down, I'm pushing forward right now. Let's do this. See how it stops? It's using the rotation of the camera, and unfortunately, that's affecting our speed, which is not what we want. So, by breaking this one back apart, breaking this one back apart, by only getting our Z rotation, we are only getting the rotation around this, our Z, our left and right, because Z would be our vertical rotation axis. And so I can look down and still move left, right. It's not affected by where I'm looking. It's only affected by my rotation. So we take that, and this is where we only need one axis. We get our right vector. Basically, right now we're looking forward. We have our rotation. If I was to get my right vector, it's going to get me the vector that is to the right of this character. It's going to give me what is that way. If I was to be looking this direction and say give me my forward vector, it's going to give me the vector that's in front of me. Pretty simple. So if I was to push to the right and tell it to give me the right vector, then I'm going to know which way is right. And so when I add movement input, it's going to say, okay, well, go right. And so now when I push right, it goes right. You may ask, well, when we push left, how does it know to go left? Pretty simple. What's the opposite of 1? If we take, for example, our right vector is 1. Or actually, let's, let's do this in degrees. Let's say our right vector is 90 to the right, 90 degrees to the right. If we multiply it by a negative 1, we're going to get negative 90, which is actually going to be to our left. Same thing with forward. Let's say forward is going to be 0. Now, in terms of vector and forward and vectors and things like that, you it's not 0, 90. But just for example purposes, let's say forward is going to be our positive forward vector. If we multiply it by negative 1, we're going to get the opposite, which is behind us. So that's why when we tell it to move right and we are pushing right, according to here, our move right, According to here, we're going to get a scale of 1 or a positive value, and it's going to move to the right. When we push to the left, we're going to get a negative 1 scale, 
So it's going to be the opposite of right, which is going to be left. So that's why if you've ever been curious on why there's only a right and a forward vector for most things, or there's only a right instead of a right and left, or a forward instead of a forward and a back, you can get the opposite just by multiplying it by a negative one. So instead of adding extra fluff, they allow you to just simply multiply it and figure it out on your own. You'll find most engines do that when it works with controls. So that's it. That is how our movement works on the keyboard using the character component using the add movement input nodes. And that's it. It's honestly as simple as that. Now I should clean this up a little bit and reorganize it, but you know, it's, it's not horrible right now. It's readable. I hope go from here, go here, here, but that's our keyboard, mo keyboard movement. And this is our mouse movement. Now it took me 35 minutes at this point in time to discuss everything, but what I've done so far in this 30 minutes, even with discussing is I've created a new project. I brought in my character. I've created a character blueprint that holds my character. I've hooked up, I've made a controller that controls my character. And in theory, ignoring the user interface, you could now move around and you can aim and look around. Now all this extra stuff, the user interface components are things that we'll work on next and will be covered in a f later video. But the first thing to start with is you need to be able to do something and that's what I did. So right there is how you, I created a character controller from scratch and a character blueprint from scratch and hooked everything up. Now if you're actually trying to do this and you're having a problem, it may be because you haven't told the game to use any of this. If you've noticed, I've jumped back and forth a few times to my game mode. I've done a video on game mode, but a game mode is basically your parent, your person in charge, and it tells the engine all of the individual components. It tells you our default pawn, default HUD, default controller, blah, 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 blah. Every one of your levels, if we went to our world setting, has a game mode. If I was to not override this right here, and hit play, it's going to use my default controller. Every single one of these worlds can have their own controller. If you go into your project settings and go into your modes, you'll find my default game mode is set to my Zilla game mode. Game modes are really simple. I've covered it before, but basically I just created a new blueprint class of game mode opened it up and told it, okay, I want to use my new character I just made and I want to use the new controller I just made. Once you've done that and once you've gone ahead and you've set up it to use your default game mode, that's all you have to do. Now, every map you load in this game, every character you load up in this game, all of these default players, any player you dropped into the game, any of your AI, here's the fun part, any of your AI you drop in, if you don't assign them a controller, are automatically going to use these as your default. So right now, for example, if I wanted to add in another character, let's say I had a, instead of a button, let's say we had a, a little siren or a warning light, one of those little flashing strobe lights. I could make another character, give it its mesh, go ahead and hit play. And that character is actually going to, like, for example, here's my test character right here, which I created in here. There's no code in here, and there's no extra stuff added in here. If I was to tell the game, like, let's say, for example, you know, let's just, oh, let's go to Izila, and let's override. Let's say our default pawn is going to be our test character, and I hit play. You'll notice my button here, I can actually move and look around, and I have no issues. Technically, I have one issue, which I'll cover in a second, but I'm using my controller to control a brand new character without having to set up that character's movement because I have a universal controller. Now, just to finish this and wrap this up, because I said I discussed bugs and things like that, there's a really annoying feature in the character movement. It's not in the character movement, sorry. It's in the spring arm itself. It's this right here. Use pawn control rotation. Because we are using in our controller the 
uh, what is it at right here? The character movement to move. Because we're using, where did it go? Right here. The controller pitch and yaw, the controller's rotation. What we need to do inside of any character that has a spring arm is you need to tell it to use the pawn control rotation. So if you're using a spring arm and you're using controller input, if this is not checked, you'll run into that issue here where I can't look. I'm not rotating around. I'm basically using the mouse right now to turn left and right because I'm telling it to turn the pawn and not the controller. When I use this and I hit play, now I'm rotating the camera. I'm rotating the spring arm and I can rotate around my character like we want. So that's one of those things that has to be done if you're going to use the controller input. Now after 40 minutes of jabbering on and discussing all of this, I'm going to go back to one of the things I said before. This is just one way of doing this. This was me using the character movement component on a character actor using the built-in handy character movement and controller nodes. All of these are completely optional. You don't have to do that. You could create a blank actor and you could control it with your own input. You could do everything by hand without using a controller capsule. And you'll find a lot of people do that when they want to do custom things. But when we've got two days to make a game, we just slap this stuff together and we get stuff working. That was the whole point of this. So yeah, let me go back and turn this back on. And basically at the end of about an hour or so of me playing around, I was able to get a character that I could actually move inside my little test map. We don't have anything to do, but at least we have movement, and that's always fun. So, this is going to wrap up our first video, because we're looking at about 40 minutes now. It doesn't seem like I covered much, but like I've said, I'm going to try to cover everything I've done from start to scratch, so you get a feel of how this is done, and you get a feel for the code itself, and how it was implemented, and as a change of pace just to see if this is something people want. So, feel free to comment below. Feel free to up, up thumb it, up thumb, up like it, like it or hate it, I guess. Like or dislike, there we go. If you like or dislike it, again, comment if you want to see more of these or not. Even if people hate these, I'm going to go ahead and continue this entire series just to get it done and finished. If this isn't your cup of tea, feel free to come back next week. If it is your cup of tea or Java or Mocha or coffee or Starbucks, I will see you again tomorrow. Have a good day.